I had a, a little bit of a question for you guys. You don't have to answer, just something to think about. Have you ever heard a child pray before? I'm sure most of us have, especially, especially those mothers out there, right? So we've heard children pray. You know, and, and I'm sure, you know, if you are a mother or, or if there's fathers watching, you know, they've taught their children how to pray. They understand at least the basics. One of my little nephews, I, I have the chance to hear him pray sometimes. Uh, before he, he actually knew how to, how to say very many words, he would, you know, he would put his head down and he'd babble whatever sounds would come out. And he'd say, Amen, and put his head back up. And so he knew the basics. He knew the, at least the basics of how to pray. And, you know, a lot of times, small children, sometimes even, even teenagers, you know, they, they learn these basics. They know that they're supposed to thank God for the food, you know, and they're supposed to, uh, to say amen at the end. Sometimes they remember that they're supposed to ask in the name of Jesus Christ. But it's something that's, that's learned. And through the years, I've had the chance at, at some of our summer camps, as well as, you know, listening to some of my nephews and, and nieces, I have mostly nephews for some reason, well, maybe the, maybe the nephews are just more memorable sometimes. They, they get into more trouble. Um, but that's beside the point. But, you know, it's interesting hearing people sometimes pray out loud for the first time. And that's really something to think about. And sometimes it, it makes me think about my own prayers. How am I doing in my, my prayers? You know, am I, am I praying in, a, in an adequate way? You know, sometimes we might... Uh, start comparing our prayers to others. We don't need to do that, of course. But it's interesting to look to, you know, to listen to other people's prayers, you know, and look in the Bible to see how am I doing with how I'm praying, even sometimes just analyzing, you know, the, the way that we pray, the kinds of things that we, we pray about. I think it's, you know, it is a good idea every once in a while to, to think about our, our prayers especially to think about the attitudes that we have when we pray. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Now, Jesus Christ gave us the proper attitude that we're supposed to have in our prayers. And this is for you know, our, own, our own good, realizing that prayer is very personal. You know, sometimes we do pray out loud. We pray out loud at services or if we're gathered for a meal, sometimes with family. There are different times for that. And there are times to pray in, in quiet on our own. But the attitude behind the prayer should always be the same. In Matthew 6, in verse 5, Matthew 6, in verse 5, it says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. So, you know, the, this word hypocrite describes somebody who says one thing and does another, or does one thing and says another. It says, For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So this is describing people who pray to be heard by others. And the, the people that Jesus was talking about, maybe they have these long, elegant prayers that they say in public, very public places, so that they can look good when they pray, look good to other people. And there are other, other examples. Well, you know, we can read on here where Jesus describes going, you know, going into your, your, your room behind closed doors and praying to God. Because the, the prayer is for God. The prayer isn't for other people. Now, sometimes we do hear each other's prayers, and that's not a bad thing. But the prayer is to God. That's, we have to remember that. And we have to remember this, this attitude, this mindset, the reason behind our prayers. It's not to go and you know, to show off, but it's to talk to God. That's the real purpose of every single prayer. It should be the purpose of every single prayer is to talk to God. Now, God it wants us to build a relationship with Him. And when you think about relationships and conversations in relationships, they're not based on, you know, repetitive words. I mean, if you have a very casual relationship... It might just be a hi, hello, how are you every once in a while, but you can't build off of that unless you take that conversation deeper and further. Well, it's the same way with our relationship with God. He wants that personal relationship. He wants us to have a conversation with Him every day, all the time. Now today we're going to look at the model prayer. 
And we're not going to use, use this prayer, you know, so that we can learn how to pray exactly these words. But we're going to take apart each, each line that Jesus gives us here. Because this is an example of how to pray. The, the type of prayer that we should be praying as well as the, the topics that we should be praying about. And it's interesting to analyze this. While we're going through this prayer, we can analyze our own prayers. We can think about the types of things that we pray about. How deep are we going in our relationship with God through these prayers? So we're going to turn to that model prayer found in this same chapter in Matthew 6. I'm going to go ahead and, and read through it to start off, and then we're going to take it piece by piece as we go through this prayer. And we often call it the model prayer because... It is a model to us in how to pray. Matthew 6 and verse 5, we already, we already read that part. But if we drop down to, to verse 9, here Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, In this manner, therefore, pray. So he's saying, this is the type of prayer that I want you to pray. And this is, this, these are the types of things that you, know, you can talk about in your prayers. So he starts off, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So he ends that prayer there. Now there are other examples of prayers that we have of Jesus even praying himself. And we have descriptions of, of how we are supposed to pray from other places as well. And we'll get into some of those as well. The first line in this prayer, it simply says, Our Father in heaven. And then it says, Hallowed be your name. The opening of this prayer, and I think the opening of, of uh, any prayer, is sort of like writing a letter. How many of you guys still write letters to people? You got a few. Yeah, I try. I need to write a letter to my grandmother right now. But at, at the beginning of a letter, there's always sort of an introduction. So it's addressing whoever the letter is to. So in our prayers, we start off that way. Now God already knows that we're talking to Him, but here, by, by using His name when we pray, we're acknowledging Him. We're letting Him know that we are acknowledging Him with our words, with our thoughts, with what's in our heart. And so we... We open the prayer by addressing God the Father. Just as Jesus Christ taught us to here. He's teaching us that we are supposed to pray to the Father. Jesus Christ always pointed to the Father rather than to Himself. And He, he was seeking after the Father's will. He was always about His Father's business. And He came to introduce us to that, you know, to show us that Father-Son relationship. That relationship that we can have with the Father, and so we can pray directly to the Father. And that's something that, that's incredible to think about. So we have this sort of address to the Father, Father in heaven, and then it continues on to praise God's name. That's part of every prayer as well, to praise God's name. Part of our praise and worship of God is giving Him that, that praise in our prayers. And here it says, hallowed be your name, it's describing you know, the name of God giving honor to it. Hallowed meaning, you know, set apart, holy, set apart for something special, different than the ways of the world, different than the things of the world. And so that, that's how we should view God and His name, even. And there's even a commandment. We're not supposed to take God's name in vain. And so we remember that even in our prayers. We treat His name as, as special. And we do use His name when we pray. We, we talk about Him as, as Jesus talked about His Father. But we have to give honor to His name. Now let's turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. There are some examples here of David praying. 1 Chronicles. Now we have a lot of David's prayers recorded in Scripture. A lot in the Psalms. And we see a lot of praise of God's name. But in this, this passage here, we see... How, how, how many times that David praises God's name? So 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles 29. Now this, this section of scripture is talking about uh, 
you know, collecting supplies for building a temple of God, preparing a house for God. And here we also have this praise of God's name. And we have this prayer to God in verse 10. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. But let's continue on in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And starting in verse 10. It says, Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. So this is a public prayer. So th there are examples of public prayer. Giving honor to God publicly for purposes. Not just to be heard. David isn't doing this to be heard. But he's doing this to praise God. To give honor to God. And he says, Blessed are you. Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. So we have that example. Praying to the Father. And giving his, Him praise. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory. The victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. Your hand is is power and might in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all and he continues on here now therefore our god we thank you and praise your glorious name but who am i and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this for all things come from you and of your own we have given you for we are aliens and pilgrims before you as were all our fathers our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope so here in David's words, he's praising God, but he's setting God up above everyone else. And that's, you know, that's one thing that we do in our prayers by praising God. We recognize that he is more powerful than, than anyone else, especially compared to us. And so we need him and we desire to draw close to him. We desire to praise his name like we see here. Now in Jesus' prayer, he sets the tone of the rest of the prayer. He sets this tone of, of humility, first of all, by you know, praising the name of the Father, uh, acknowledging His greatness. But He also, in Jesus' prayer, He, he uses this plural. He's, he's, you know, he uses we and us and our. And that sets the tone for the prayer as well. He's, he's praying not just for Himself, and He's teaching His disciples not only to pray for themselves, but also for other people. So here, G Jesus sets that tone. When he said, Our Father in heaven. And we are supposed to pray for others as well. We're supposed to acknowledge one another in our prayers. Not that we praise each other. We don't do that in our prayers. But we pray for one another. We think about each other. And we do also pray for our own needs. Our own worries. Our own anxieties. Our own healing. But we also pray for, the, that, for those things for other people. Let's turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 is, is a great book for Christian living, learning how to live like Jesus Christ, having a mind like His, words like His, actions. And here we have some very good instructions in how we are supposed to live. James chapter 5. So this is the last chapter in James. Now this, this section of Scripture talks about uh, praying for, for, for yourself if you're suffering, praying for others, singing praises if you're sick, uh, reaching out to the elders so that you can be anointed with oil so that other people can pray for you. In verse 16, it says, confess your trespasses to one another. That means we, you know, if we're going through something difficult, we tell somebody about it so we can encourage one another. And it says, and pray for one another. That you may be healed. We're supposed to pray for one another. If we expect other people to pray for us, it makes sense that we would pray for others as well. And here we have this, these instructions, direct instructions. Pray for one another. And then it says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So if we are righteous in the eyes of God, and also humble in the eyes of God, in our prayers even, God hears those prayers. He hears our prayers. And it says that those prayers avail much. There's power in our prayers because of God's power. Because of us being able to acknowledge Him and call on Him for His, His power. So we see that first part of this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Acknowledging who God is, giving Him praise. 
setting him up as, as more important than ourselves, humbling ourselves and acknowledging his greatness and his power. We also see in this first section that Jesus set this tone of praying for one another in, in our prayers. Now the second part of this prayer that we read here in Matthew chapter 6, we'll, let's go ahead and turn back there because we're, we're going to read another verse in Matthew chapter 6. So Matthew chapter 6. We won't necessarily turn back here every time. So Matthew 6, in verse 10, we have the next part of this prayer. And we're just going to read part of verse 10 here. It says, Your kingdom come. It's very simple, but it's very profound. This is our requesting for God to bring His, His kingdom. So after we acknowledge God's greatness, we acknowledge His name, we give Him praise, What's our next thought? What is our next thought after our, our first thought? This even goes to our, our everyday, our everyday lives. Our first thought should be on God, on our relationship with God. What's our very next thought? His kingdom, seeking His kingdom. So here we have this example in this prayer, and it's very simply put, your kingdom come. And we know that, that God is the only one who knows when his kingdom is going to come to this earth. We know he's, he's the only one who knows when Jesus Christ is going to return. And he has complete control over it. Our prayers aren't going to somehow shift that date that God has set. We can't move him that way. But he wants to see that we are desiring his kingdom to come. That we seek it in our lives. Now, later on in the chapter, we have this, this, uh, this request, this you know, command this direction that we're supposed to seek God's kingdom above everything else. In verse 33 of Matthew 6, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In other words, all of our, our daily needs that we have that God knows about, he's going to take care of those if we're seeking his kingdom first. If we put him as, as a priority and his righteousness, living his way of life, if that's our priority in life, then he's going to take care of all our other needs. He's going to make sure that we have everything that we possibly could need in this life. That's a wonderful, comforting promise. But we know we have to, we have to seek his kingdom. And one way that we put his, his kingdom and seeking it in our minds, you know, first thing, is that we pray and we ask God to bring his kingdom. We let him know that we're thinking about his promises that he has in store for us. We let him know that we desire eternal life. We desire to, to be close with him for all eternity and to live his way of life in that kingdom because only those who are, are living a righteous life, willing to repent of their sins, are going to be part of that kingdom. Nobody else is gonna be part of that kingdom. And so by, by acknowledging that, we're acknowledging that we're ready to seek his kingdom. We're re ready to change our lives and to become righteous like he desires us to be. As I mentioned, there's, you know, there's no way that we can change God's, God's plans that he has by saying, bring your kingdom sooner. But he does want us to acknowledge that we do desire it. And we also acknowledge the need that this world has for his kingdom to come. And we look around at what's happening in the world, so, you know, in our own neighborhoods, even in different countries, all over the place. We don't see people living peacefully. We don't see peacemakers that are, that are trying to have peace with everyone else. Instead, we see wars, rumors of wars. We see people fighting with one another. We see people uh, going against God's laws, not seeking righteousness. And we know that this world desperately needs God's righteousness and that healing that comes with his kingdom, all sorts of healing. Healing on a physical level, on a spiritual level, emotional level. All types of healing that are needed by this world. Now, it, I always find it interesting, you know, when we're going through these prayers to think that, you know, God knows that we need His kingdom. He tells us and He shows us in so many ways. You know, it's, He also knows who He is. And so when we pray to Him, it's interesting for me, at least, to think about that. You know, a lot of the things that, that, that we put on our prayers is often for our good as well as to praise God. Because God already knows these things. 
you know, there's, there's no, you know, by us telling him that we desire his kingdom to come, you know, he already knows that, that his kingdom is coming. He already knows that we need it. But it's, it's that, again, that acknowledgement that we have on our part and allowing ourselves to express that acknowledgement to him let him know and building that relationship being comfortable opening up to him with our difficulties and our desires and that's really something i think very profound about being able to pray to talk to god we can open up to him we can become personal in our prayers always when we pray to him as we go through our prayer as we're praying and as we're analyzing this prayer Having some of these, these very important things first helps shape our prayers as we go along. It helps shape our mindset. If we acknowledge God first, we're, we're humbling, humbly going before Him, and we're acknowledging His kingdom that we seek it, that's going to help frame the rest of our prayers. So we might, we might think twice about asking God for something that's more frivolous, if it's something that we don't actually need. And we can ask God for anything, but it's good to, to think about the things that we do desire to think about the things that we do ask God for before we just jump in there and say, oh God, I, I need this, this uh, you know, whatever it might be. I'm trying to think of a good example. I need this new car because I don't like the color of my old one or something like that. That's a ridiculous example. But, you know, acknowledging God's kingdom first before we get into our own needs helps our frame of mind as we're praying. Now let's turn to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. There's a passage here that describes some of the end times, the events that are going to happen. There's some, some parables that Jesus uses to describe some of these end time events. Sorry, did I say Matthew 13? Yeah. Let's go to Mark 13. Okay, here we go. That makes more sense. Mark chapter 13. So Mark chapter 13 here. Jesus is talking about these end time events and he does use some analogies in some of these places as well. In verse 19, we'll start reading in verse 19. Here he's describing these events that are coming and we have a chance to read these and we look around and we see hints of these things coming. He says, for in those days there will be tribulation and we see hints of tribulation now in this time, such as has not been since the beginning of creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. So the, the things that are coming that we haven't seen yet are going to be more terrible than anything that anyone in history has ever seen. Verse 20. Here's the important part for us. It says, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake whom he chose, he shortened the days. So those who acknowledge his kingdom, who are seeking his kingdom... God is merciful to us and he shortens the, the time of tribulation. He doesn't allow it to go on forever and ever. He has an end point to it. And he says he, he's even going to shorten this, shorten the tribulation, the difficult times for our sake because he knows it is a very difficult time. And he knows that, his, that we need his kingdom and we let him know that we desire his kingdom. But it's very interesting to think. It's because of our sake that God is going to shorten those days. All right, let's go into the third part of this, this prayer, this example prayer that we have from Jesus Christ. So again, in verse 10, Matthew chapter 6. We can turn back over there if you want. So we already read about our desire for God's kingdom to come. This next part of verse 10, it says, Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. We know that, that God's will reigns supreme. God allows things to happen, even if they aren't things that He would approve of. He allows those things. And this is our humble request to, to submit to God's rule in our life. You know, acknowledging that we desire His will in our lives. That we desire His will for this world. Rather than saying, well, I, I wish that... I wish that I could be, you know, that things could continue on as they are. Um, but in, instead, we're reaching out to God and we're saying, I, I want things to be done your way, not my own way. Uh, there's, you know, you look around, at, you know, things that are happening. There's a lot of 
a lot of politics happening right now. Here, there's a it's a uh, an election year, and whenever there's an election year, especially there's a lot of politics, and a lot of people are arguing. They think that they have the answer to our problems. They think that they know what's going to solve all of the world's problems. And if we only would accept their way, then everything would be fine. There would be peace. But how often has that actually worked in history? If we think about it, never, because there's always been wars all through history. Maybe, maybe short periods of peace. I emphasize short, you know, very short periods of peace through history. But, you know, no, none of the, the world's rulers can, can accomplish what God can accomplish. And so we need God's will to be done. We need to, to have Him be in charge. We know that Jesus Christ is going to come to this earth and he's going to reign on, on earth. And nobody's going to elect him into that position. He's going to come and he's going to take it because it's his. And he is even going to bring us along. If we're willing to, to work with him according to his will, then he'll have us by his side reigning here on this earth. And only doing things his way will there truly be peace. So here in this part of this prayer, it's our humble acknowledgement that we seek God's will instead of our own will. Because no matter how, how many times we think that we know what is best, we don't. Especially compared to God. I mean, unless we're, we're saying that God knows best, then, then we're right in that. We can, we can have confidence in that fact. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. And when we think about acknowledging God's will... We have to also acknowledge that not everything's going to be nice and easy. Not everything is going to be pleasant. We already heard about times of troubles, times of tribulation. Romans 8 verse 28. We have to acknowledge that God has a plan that he's working that's good for us. In everything that happens. Romans 8 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say called according to our own purposes, our own desires, but it's, it says according to his purpose. All things work together for good. And that means the trials that we go through, the difficulties that we see around us. Now, we don't want them to happen. We don't urge them on. But we know that God has a purpose in all these things to demonstrate his goodness, his power. And we know that Jesus Christ was tempted. He went through all these same things for a purpose. And we have to go through these things as well. And we have a God who understands the hardship that we go through. And by acknowledging His will in our life, we're saying, Okay, I know that, that you, understand, you understand the temptations that I go through in this life. You understand the troubles that I'm up against. You can write in your notes Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews 4, 15 this talks about how Jesus Christ was, you know, he's our high priest and he, is, he was tempted in all points, but without sin. And he didn't take the easy way out. He followed the will of the Father. Let's turn to Luke chapter 22. In Luke 22. Now he could have just, you know, he could have said, oh, I'm going to take the easy way out. It's too painful. But he kept on because he knew that the Father's will was greater than his own will. Now, he didn't desire to, to take the easy way out, but he was in a lot of pain in the very, you know, the last hours of his life. And I think, you know, for us, if we were in that position, we might take the easy way out. I don't know. We haven't had to suffer up to that point, so we don't know. Luke 22, in verse 41, Luke 22, 41 here we have this prayer that Jesus is praying. Maybe we'll start in verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. In verse 40, when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. So he's, he's teaching them that they should pray for that protection, for that guidance. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed. So here we have Jesus Christ praying himself, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
here again we have this example from Jesus Christ. He's praying that his Father's will will be done. He's acknowledging that it's not his own will. Even though he is God, he's the Son of God, he's leaving it to the Father, to God the Father. It's his will that needs to be done. He has the perfect plans. And it, I'm, I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ, uh, you know, he submitted to God the Father, to his will, because otherwise we wouldn't have a Savior who died for our sins. We wouldn't have a high priest who could go before the Father in our place, who can relate to us in everything. So it's very, it was very important that he did that for God's plan to happen. If he didn't, who knows where we would be. But it's a good thing that, that he had perfect righteous character and humility. See, even God demonstrates humility. That's a wonderful thing. That's a huge example for us there. Now, we should, we should follow Jesus Christ's example every time that we pray. We should always acknowledge the Father. We seek his kingdom. And we also submit to his will in our life. By acknowledging that in our prayers, it helps with our mindset to get our mindset right for our day or for, for the evening, whenever we are praying. And it helps us also to be able to draw close to God so that we can listen to Him. Because if we're thinking about our own ways, our own thoughts, what's good for us, then we aren't going to be able to hear what God has in store for us, what great things that He has ready for us. We won't be able to draw close to Him in that relationship with Him. Now the next part of the prayer, this is the fourth part that we're going to look at here. In Matthew 6 and verse 11. So this gets into a little bit of our own needs now. Now again, here Jesus is acknowledging the fact that, that we pray not only for our own needs, but also for the needs of other people. He says in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. Now we can look at this a few different ways. We can look at it as physical nourishment and also spiritual nourishment that we request from God. In the account in Luke chapter 11, you can put this one in your notes, Luke 11, 13, it says, give us day by day our daily bread. That means we have to go to God every single day and ask Him for our, our needs, acknowledging His greatness, seeking His kingdom every single day, day by day. We don't just say one prayer and, and think, well, we're set for the week. I don't have to pray again for a while. Now we go to God every single day. Now let's, we're going to drop down a little bit in Matthew 6 and verse 19. Here as Jesus Christ is teaching us how to pray, because we are his disciples. Here he teaches us the kinds of things that we're supposed to, to seek after, the kinds of things that we're supposed to ask God for. You know, and this, this goes to our priorities, our priorities in life. And sometimes it's, it's easy to, you know, to make sure that our priorities are straight, especially we're in, when we're in times of need. But sometimes it's, it's difficult to make sure that we are, we're seeking God's, God's will and we're not desiring things that we shouldn't have. So in Matthew 6 and verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. You know, don't seek after all of these physical things that aren't going to do any good. That doesn't mean that we don't enjoy life, that we don't, uh, you know, have a good job and, and be able to provide for ourselves and our families. That's not what that's talking about. But that's not our, our priority. Our priority can't be the physical things, gathering physical things. It says where moth and rust destroy. You know, all the physical things that we have around us, they're going to be destroyed. It says where thieves break in and steal. You know, there's no guarantee that just because we have something nice, that even God gave something to us, that it can't be taken away at a certain point. There's no guarantee of that. The only thing that, we can, that, that God guarantees are the spiritual things. He doesn't guarantee everlasting physical things at all. He never does that. Verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here verse 21 it gets into our priorities what's in our hearts what's on our minds it says for where your treasure is there your heart will be also where's our focus when we pray even when we ask god for the physical things that we do need where are our priorities are we asking for you know so much that you know that we can hoard it and not not help anybody else i'm sure we're not we're not doing that but 
you know, look at, look at our priorities, even when we're asking for the things that we do need. Now, if we drop down to verse 31, you know, and, and even the, the few verses before it, you know, it says, don't worry about these things that you need. Don't worry about the fact that you might not, you know, you don't think you'll have enough clothes to wear or food to eat. God says, don't worry about those things because he's going to take care of them. And we seek God's kingdom first. But in verse 31, it says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all of these, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So we do request those things, but we know that God knows that we need those things. We don't have to worry. You know, we can say, Father, give me the food that I need for today and help provide for me for tomorrow. But we don't, we don't have to dwell on that and have anxiety over that. That doesn't do us any good. That's not going to move God even, you know, closer to us or move his hand for us. He already knows our needs and he's going to provide for those needs for us. He says so right here in his word. It's all about priorities here. In verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I think that's a really beautiful verse. We have enough difficulty making it through the day, each day. Why do we have to worry about tomorrow? God is the only one that knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know. And by worrying about it, it's not going to help anything. It's not going to change what God has planned for tomorrow. So we don't have to worry about these things. But we do ask God and we acknowledge that our needs are met by Him. By this asking, it's another way that we acknowledge that we need even our physical sustenance from God, that He sustains us. He is our sustainer. He is our creator. He made us and He knows every single in and out of our, our, our physical bodies. He knows our character. He knows our minds, what's in our hearts. And He will provide for our needs. And here in our prayers, as Jesus gave the example, we can acknowledge that fact, that we know that our needs are met from Him. <coughs> Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Or sorry, Luke. Luke chapter 11. I keep trying to go to Matthew. Already in Matthew. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. Even though God knows our needs, even before we know them, sometimes He wants us to... To, to diligently pray for the things that we need, for the things that we know that He can provide. Luke chapter 11, in verse 9, He says, So I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Even though God already knows what we need, He tells us to ask for it. Acknowledge that we need from Him. Acknowledge that He can provide for us. Seek and you will find Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. So through our prayers we acknowledge that we need God, that He is our provider. But He wants to hear us pray to Him. He wants to hear us seek His guidance instead of our own guidance or the guidance of, of anybody else. Verse 11 we won't continue on here. We'll stop there. This is about also, you know, taking care of other people. But the important parts were found for us in this, in this topic in verses 9 and 10. That we have to diligently seek after the things of God. Sometimes God wants us to, He wants to know that we're serious about seeking His ways. He wants to know that we're serious about asking Him for healing, for providing for us in every, everything. As I mentioned earlier in that model prayer, we also have, you know, that example of Jesus Christ using that us and our. He's, he's not, uh, you know, he's not only praying for himself, not only teaching us to pray for ourselves, but for the needs of others. That daily physical nourishment and spiritual nourishment, we need to pray that, that others can receive that as well. You know, we pray that those who don't have very much, that God will continue to pr provide for them. And he does. And we do, you know, in that, we don't take the, the role of God away by helping to provide for others. But sometimes God blesses us with more than we need so that we can give to other people. And while we have that blessing, we should utilize that blessing and become blessings to others as God is to us. And we acknowledge that those blessings come from God through our prayers. 
And we know that we need that, that physical sustenance that comes from God, but also the spiritual sustenance that comes from Him. Now, Jesus Christ, when He was quoting scriptures to Satan, He acknowledges that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by the Word of God. This is where our priority has to come from. And this is where our priority is, in this spiritual food. We do ask for that physical food, but we also ask for that spiritual food. For that understanding of what is in God's Word, so that we can grow and mature in that character. Okay, we're going to move to the fifth part of this prayer. So this is Matthew 6 and verse 12. Matthew 6 and verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, Jesus Christ, do you think he's just talking about physical debt here? No, I was hoping some people would shake their, their heads. He's not just talking about physical debt here. He's talking about spiritual debt. Now, what is that spiritual debt that we, that we get ourselves into in life? What is it? You guys know? Sin. Yeah, what's the consequence of sin? What is that debt that we are indebted? Death. Exactly. We want God to forgive us that debt that we have entered into through sin. We need that forgiveness. Otherwise, we can't live. We have to have that forgiveness. And so here in our prayers, we need to ask God for that forgiveness of our sins. And this is very personal. And it also talks about as we forgive our debtors, so those who have sinned against us, we have to have that attitude of forgiveness toward others. Sometimes we actually go and, you know, we seek that, you know, that uh, reconciliation with people, but we forgive them even if they don't acknowledge the fact. Even if they say... I don't care if I hurt you. We have to be willing and ready to forgive no matter what because that forgiveness affects our forgiveness from God. And that's so important. In Luke chapter 11, the way that it's phrased in Luke 11 verse 4, we can turn over there. Luke 11 verse 4. It says, and forgive us our sins. Is there a more straightforward? Jesus Christ says, forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, who have sinned against us, even those physical debts. And we do not lead, and, and do not lead us into temptation. We'll stop there. That gets into further parts of the prayer. But here, Jesus Christ is showing us that we have to ask God for forgiveness of our sins and, and also acknowledge that we are willing and ready to forgive other people as they sin against us or as they have even physical debts against us we have to be ready to forgive them otherwise our father isn't going to be ready to forgive us unless we are first ready to forgive this is our chance you know to have an attitude like god a mindset like god to be like god to act like him he is the one that forgives our sins if we want to be like God, if we want to have His character, we have to have that same forgiving attitude all the time. We can't go around with a chip on our shoulders or, you know, something in our heart that, that eats away at us. We have to be able to let go of, of, you know, difficulties, of contentions, let go of sins, our own sins as well as the sins of other people. Otherwise, we can't move past those sins. We can't move past those hurts and we can't draw close to God and we can't have our own sins forgiven. Now let's let's drop down to verse 14 here at the end of this you know the the main core of this this is in Matthew 6 back in Matthew 6 now Matthew 6 verse 14 here we have uh, you know at the end of this prayer Jesus continues to teach about forgiveness he says for if you forgive men their trespasses if you forgive other people their sins your Heavenly Father will also forgive you that's that forgiving attitude that we have to have but if you do not forgive men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses it's an absolute truth that God has set in place here if we want our sins forgiven we have to be able to to forgive the sins of others so this is an attitude that we have to learn from God here in his examples 
And we have to practice it, otherwise it's meaningless. All of these things are meaningless unless we practice these things, apply them in our lives. Now let's move on with this prayer. So the sixth part, there are seven parts of this prayer, I think. Now there's eight. I added an eighth. So there's, there's eight parts to this prayer. The sixth part here in verse 13, it says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So this is asking God to guide us in the right way, to give us protection. Now the word temptation here, it could be translated as trial or proving. Maybe asking God, you know, please God, don't make me have to go through something difficult. But remember, we've, at this point, we've already asked for God's will. So we're willing to go through those difficult times, even though we'd rather not. So this word could also mean trial or proving. Now God does allow us to go through trials so that we can be tested, so that we can be proved, proved righteous, or you know, sometimes proved not so righteous, and we have a lot more work to do. But God allows us to be tested so that He can see what we're made of, so that we can grow. In Psalm 11, verse 5, you can write this in your notes. Psalm 11, verse 5, it says, The Lord tests the righteous. So God does test us. He does put us through tests. He does allow us to go through trials. To be, He allows us to be tempted. There's another place that we'll read later that says that God doesn't tempt us Himself, but He does allow us to go through trials to be tested. For a reason. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And we know that God does allow us to go through trials, to be tested. But we also know that He doesn't make us go through something that, that He's not going to help us with, that He doesn't think that we can, we can get through. Sometimes that means it's a whole lot, though. I think God thinks that we can make it through a lot tougher times than we think that we can. Verse 13 of, of 1 Corinthians 10, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Sometimes we see examples in the Bible of people you know, having a way of escape, but sometimes that way of escape is death. That's a, that's a fact. Sometimes God you know, allows people to even go you know, all the way up until death because He knows that we can handle it. And we pray that we don't have to go up to that point, but we do also, again, acknowledge God's will for us and, and acknowledge the fact that we, He can give us the, the strength to go through the hardest trials that anyone can go through in this life. Now, in the, in the same, uh, this same phrase that we just read about, uh, you know, about this, or from this prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, this is acknowledging that we, we fight a spiritual battle. The evil one is talking about our enemy, Satan. He is our enemy. He wants us to fail. And he can't touch us if God isn't willing for him to be able to touch us. If we're close to God, if we're praying to God, acknowledging his strength and asking for his protection, he's not going to allow Satan to be able to, to touch us or to be able to, to tempt us past what we're capable of being tempted to. And we look at the example of Job. You know, God allowed Satan to go so far, but Job... Uh, Satan had to stop whenever God said to stop. This, if we acknowledge the fact that God is more powerful than our enemies, we acknowledge the fact that God is in control, that He can stop any of our enemies, any of them, dead in their tracks. And He has a plan to stop Satan, dead in his tracks. He has a plan to put him away so that he can't tempt anybody else ever again. That time will come. Now, Satan isn't our only enemy. And in some ways, he's not even our greatest enemy. Because we know that God is more powerful than him. Now, greater, a greater enemy to us, in most cases, is ourselves. Now, let's turn to James chapter 1. We'll turn back to the book of James. James chapter 1. 
In the book of James, we learn a lot about our own human nature and our battles that we have with human nature. And we realize that, you know, the temptations that exist in our lives, most often they come from within us, from our own, our own thoughts, sometimes our own desires, when we get off course. This is where our greatest temptations come from. James 1 and verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot tempt by evil. We know that God tests us, but he doesn't tempt us, trying to get us to sin. Nor does he himself tempt anyone, it says. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then it goes on to describe the development of sin from our own desires. That's where sin begins. It begins in the mind with our own desires, our own thoughts. If we entice those thoughts, we, we give in to them, then sin begins to develop into an actual act. So it's not just a thought, it's also an act. And we know that the thought is just as dangerous and sinful as the act, because it can lead to other things. So here we, we see that you know, one of our biggest enemies is ourselves, our own temptations, our own minds. And we have to acknowledge that so that we can get past that, so we can move past it, so we can work on those, those temptations that we have, so that we can grow closer to God and put those things aside. But until we acknowledge those things, then we can't put them aside. Until we acknowledge the sin that we have in us, we can't have that sin forgiven. And we can't allow God to, to work with us to overcome that sin. But if we have God on our side, we can overcome anything. We can work through any trial. We can overcome any temptation that even comes from ourselves. And we can be protected from our enemy. Ultimately, even you know, past moving past any of the, you know, the, the time where we will be uh, susceptible to anything that Satan can throw at us. Or that comes from ourselves you know we're looking to a time when we will be uh, spirit beings will be perfected and we won't have to worry about temptation any longer but we first have to work through trials we first have to work through temptations and sins that we have before we get to that point okay let's move on to the seventh not not quite the last part of this prayer in Matthew 6 Matthew 6 verse 13 Matthew 6 verse 13 this kind of goes along with that that last part you know asking for God's protection in our lives and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one we already read that part for yours here we go for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever this is another acknowledgement even at the end of our prayers of God's amazing power of everything that we've asked for he is the one that we look to for all these things, for protection, for guidance, for love, for forgiveness, for our, our needs. He is the one that has the kingdom and he is getting it ready for us and he's going to bring it to this earth. And he is the one that has the power and he wants to share that power with us. When he gives us his Holy Spirit after baptism, after we have those hands laid on us, he's sharing his power with us. And he wants to share his glory with us forever. And here in our prayers, we can acknowledge that we desire to be glorified with him when the time comes. We desire to, you know, to have that power in us, working in us and through us and with us. And we desire his kingdom and everything that it, it means. So in our prayers, we acknowledge that fact. I don't know that everything should be fine. Ask her to reset. I don't know. Everything's fine on my end. <laughs> so here in this last, you know, almost the last part of the this prayer, we're acknowledging the great things that God has in store for us as well, the kingdom that's coming. We're acknowledging the fact that we will be like God. There are verses that describe the fact that, you know, when Jesus Christ returns, we'll know what he looks like because we'll see him and we're going to be like him. We're going to be changed to be like him. Now in Philippians 2, Jesus Christ, or it, it, Paul writes that Jesus Christ didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. God wants to share in his glory. 
He wants us to be in His family, to be God beings. And in our prayers, we acknowledge that fact, that we desire to be part of His family, the God family, to be one with Him and with His Son, to be part of their family, to submit to His, to his will in everything and to seek His kingdom and to give Him the glory for everything good that happens in our lives. Everything that we accomplish, everything good that we have, we have to give God the glory for that. And here in our prayers, we can acknowledge that. Acknowledge that it is God who gives us every great thing, every good thing, every blessing that we have. It's not because of anything that we've done, but because of what He has done. Now we're going to read the very last word that's here in this, in this model prayer, this example of a prayer here. It simply says, Amen. And we see this word all throughout Scripture at the end of prayers, at the end of sometimes psalms. And this word, Amen, it's a word that, that is used to express agreement. It's simple. So when we say Amen, it just means that I agree. I think the things that I said in my prayer are truthful. That's why we're careful with our words when we pray. You know, we don't want to pray something that's not truthful. Of course, God would know if we were lying to Him. He knows that. But here we're acknowledging that we agree with everything that we said. We're okay with what we said. And when we hear other people's prayers, sometimes we automatically say amen. Sometimes it's because we're, maybe we're being polite. It's what we've, we've always done. But this should remind us that we should be, you know, listening to what other people pray about. You might hear a prayer that somebody prays and you think, well, that's not right. Why are they saying that in their prayer? So in that case, you might not say amen. Like, well, I disagree with that. I don't agree with what they said. Maybe most, but I don't agree with something that they said. And so you might not say amen. And most of the time, when we hear prayer, like prayers at, at services, at the beginning of service and the end of service, most of the time, those are pretty basic prayers. And most of the time, we just, you know, we say amen and we're okay. But that word amen shouldn't be taken lightly. It is an acknowledgement that we agree with whatever somebody said whether it's in a prayer or otherwise. I mean, you know, it's, it's a word that we, you know, we sometimes throw around, but we have to be careful with our words in that. And, you know, we have to be careful with uh, just accepting anything that somebody says, maybe just because, well, it's a prayer, it must be good then. We have to make sure that we're listening to the prayers of others, just like we are careful with our own words. Now, in the, in the Hebrew, this word can literally, it can be translated as, as sure or truly or so be it. Well, truth, it's like saying, you know, at the end of the prayer, well, that's truth. The things that were said are true. It's the same in Greek, very, very similar. And it's an affirmation that something is true or sure. So we, when we use that word, we're acknowledging that what is in our prayers, we're okay with having said. We agree with it. And it's also kind of a, you know, almost like an end to our prayers. Like, I'm finished, I'm finished talking now. Of course, there's, there's one more element in prayers that's not mentioned in this model prayer. Now, Jesus Christ describes it in other places. Let's turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We'll, we'll go beyond just this model prayer. This is just one example of a prayer. It kind of gives us the, you know, the framework of what a good prayer might be. All the, the main elements here. But there's one other element that Jesus even... You know, he tells us about, he describes, and when he taught his disciples to pray, he told them to also pray in his name. He is our high priest. We have to do everything in his name. We pray to the Father, but we do so in the name of the Son. Because it's in his name, through his sacrifice, through his blood, that we can be forgiven of our sins. It's through him that we can go directly to the Father, because he is at the Father's right hand. He is our high priest. Our intercessor. <coughs> John 14, verse 13. He says, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Of course, that's always according to His will. Now, ver chapter 15, and verse 16. John 15, and verse 16. Here Jesus is talking to his disciples. Here he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit shall, should remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, 
he may give you. So again, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. One more example here in chapter 16 in verse 23. Verses 23 and 24 here in chapter 16, it says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So there we're supposed to pray to the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Now by asking... All, of, all the things that we pray for in the name of Jesus Christ, we're acknowledging that we have to go through Him. We're acknowledging the fact that we are saved by Him, that we're allowed to pray to the Father because of His sacrifice, because He was resurrected. We acknowledge His authority above us. And that's a, you know, it's a beautiful thing to be able to do. And so we pray, as, as He taught us, to pray in His name. We ask all of these things in His name. But if we forget the name of Jesus Christ, the Father's not going to hear us in our prayers. And I'm not talking about if you accidentally forget to ask something in Jesus' name. I'm talking about if we ignore the fact that we must pray in the name of the Son. Is God the Father going to hear us? It would be the same as trying to receive forgiveness of our sins from the Father without the blood of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. But we know that we can go to the Father because of the Son. And so we acknowledge and we give authority to the Son through our prayers even, as we are taught to do. Now that's the end of that model prayer. Now it is good from time to time for us to go through the things that we do, to analyze how we live our lives, even look at our prayers. We can look at our, our Bible study. We can look at how we talk, the way that we, we do things, how we present ourselves. It's good for us to do this. That doesn't mean we go through and we nitpick every little thing. No, but we, all, we are trying to always to grow and to mature in ways that God would approve of. And that's very important. We can even do that in our prayers. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, hopefully we can improve our prayer life. We can have deeper conversations with God, more important conversations than just you know the, the small things, the simple things. Now the simple things are important. But we also need to take time to talk with God about the deep things, the personal things, our personal growth, our, our personal forgiveness, our personal maturing in life. And one way we can do that is by reading through the scriptures, the examples that we have of prayer, especially that example that Jesus Christ gave us of this model prayer. It sets a framework for us when we pray.